Hello and welcome to another Match Day Live. A very special guest today. We've got James Constable. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, thanks very much for coming on. Um, right, okay, we'll talk about um, the lineups uh, in just a moment. The first thing I want to ask is what is the most common question you get asked by Oxford fans? My favourite goal is normally uh, one, and, and obviously a lot of times I get asked about the Swindon saga and things like that, which is which is the two main ones that I always get asked about. Excellent. Okay, good. Right. Let's uh, have a look at today's lineup as Oxford United take on Blackpool. Now, I know you've been able to uh, watch a fair few of the games. I'm sure there have been com conflicts with your your other commitments, mm -hmm. footballing commitments, but you know who the who the players are. So just to talk you through the lineup, we've got uh, Jack Stevens in goal. Um, the back four from the other day, Ruffles, Atkinson, Moore and Hanson. Um, from your sort of experience playing and so on, were you surprised to see Stevens come in at the point he did during the season? And how impressed have you been with how he stepped up to it? I would, yeah, probably say a little bit surprised just because obviously being here first time and, and obviously Eastie was was a was a part of the club then and, and seeing how good a goal he was and um, he's done fantastically well for Oxford. So to sort of see it happen middle of the season was was obviously a bit of a surprise. But obviously, like I say, for, for Jack, who's come in and, and, and done fantastically well, it's it's a great sort of response from him to be given that opportunity and, and for him to take it. And I know obviously he's doing well and I'm, I'm sure he'd be desperate to, to, to try and get back in. And, and as a player, you want to play every week. So I'm sure it, it, it'd be finding it tough not not having that number one shirt and being out there sort of week in, week out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you say him as a person he's he seems fully supportive of, of Stevens and their relationship seems fantastic and will probably improve both of the players yeah definitely I th like you say with Eastie there's never going to be a case of him feeling anything sort of negative towards Jack I think as a, as a player it's always tough when when you're sort of dropped and, and someone else comes in but I don't think you'll ever sort of hold that personally against him you're all in it for the same the same cause the same sort of hope which is to be successful so if, if it means someone else coming in I'm sure it would be supporting him and helping him in any way he can. Uh, right okay I mentioned Hanson then uh, just in front of the back four you've got Gorin as well those two players um, I'm a big fan of they there's something a bit um, Gandalf you cannot pass type <laughs> uh, thing about them uh, Andy Wing who you work with yeah. sort of very closely at the moment very similar players. If they want to stop someone, they will stop someone. From the same mould, like you say, it, it makes a huge difference. I think for the back four, it gives them confidence to know they, they've got someone there. For the rest of the sort of midfield and forward players, they know they've got a bit of protection, so it gives them a little bit more freedom to go forward and, and be creative, knowing you've got that that person there that's going to sort of, like say, put the wall up and stop, stop the opposing team getting. So um, it makes a huge difference to, I think, how they play. And, and like I say, they're, they're both players that have been massively important this season. Uh, yeah, um, just in front of Gorin, you've got Brannigan and Kelly. Both have a lot of creativity and their pressing on Tuesday night was exceptional. Um, it, when you are in front of players that are helping you press like that, does it just uh, make you feel a bit more confident that, you know, the whole team are together? Yeah, and I think, like you say, it, it also gives them that little bit of, if you see someone else chasing and shutting down, it's sort of like, well, I should go then, and, and it encourages the rest of the team to do it. So. I think it, a lot of the time it starts with Matty up front and, and, and that sort of kick starts it. And then, like you say, everybody sort of follows and it makes a huge difference when you've got that energy and that, that amount of pressing that, that encourages everyone else to do it and gives them hopefully a chance to win the ball higher up the pitch and, and obviously closer to the opposing goal. Yep. Um, and then uh, on the wings, there is uh, Sykes and Barker. Now they can swap in amongst themselves plenty of, of pace uh, and then at some point you know you've got Shadipo can come on you've got Adji can come on so lots of sort of pacey options uh, Hall on the bench who who I know that you obviously played with mm -hmm. with those attacking options um, do you think that you we, we could see the same intensity that we saw on Tuesday night you would hope so like say I think with, with like say the players you mentioned they, they've got bags of ability but it also makes it incredibly hard for, for an opposing team when they can just switch and go from one side to the other um, and keep swapping during the 90 minutes it makes it hard you get sort of so sort of set in your ways you as a, as a player you want to know who you're marking you want to know who you're, you're sort of trying to defend so when they swap places and it changes to someone else I can it can sort of unsettle the the opposing team so um it, it like you say with the, when you name the players on the bench are all full of quality and they come on and and, and Dan who's come on recently and, and scored important goals so it, it, it's here be full of confidence and, and obviously Sam back on the bench as well makes a, a huge difference for the 
difference for the players to know we've got that quality to come on if needed. Um, right, so the, the last player to come to in the um, in the starting eleven is Matty Taylor. Obviously, any goal scorer goes through a few games without scoring. It, it maybe starts to play on their mind. This is his first game back after scoring a couple. It, we said on Tuesday night on this on this live stream, once he gets that one, he'll get two, three, four, whatever, and, and that will bring him into the next games. Once you have got through that drought and you have scored, how do you feel going into the next game? A huge weight off your shoulders. Uh, like I say, I, I had many occasions where I go five, six, seven games without a goal, and, and it's secretly that the staff and the players and everyone's like, it's going to come. Like, don't worry. I remember Hodgie and, and Mickey and Chris were always like, look, it's going to come. You, you work hard enough, you do the right things in training, it'll come. It just it come off your backside or come off your shin or whatever, but it's just getting over that that little run of, of not scoring. But let's say for Matty to to do what he's done, he's obviously had five, six games without a goal and then and then gone and scored two on Tuesday night. And and now I'm sure the rest of the sort of the week he's been full of confidence and raring to go again. You wanna once you've come out of that drive, you do, you want to play on after a Tuesday, you want to play on a Wednesday or Thursday, you're just desperate to get that next game and I'm sure he'd be no different. He'd be looking forward to getting back out. Yeah, and as you said that applies to Adri, it, play, it applies to Winnell who Started scoring just before he got injured again. Um, other players on the bench, uh, obviously Easty, we've we've sort of touched upon at Hall. Um, we've we've mentioned Jadipo and Adri, we've mentioned, but we've also got Winnell, Ford, and Grayson. Uh, now Ford and Grayson in particular, between the two of them, they cover eighty percent of the pitch. Mm. Uh, how important is it to have those players on the bench that you know if anyone gets injured, they can sort of go and do a job? Well, like I say, I think this season probably more than ever. It, the amount of, of pressure and, and sort of strain put on squads has, has been like no other. I think the games, obviously the Tramia game was sort of 48 hours after the previous game. So the, the sort of reliance on, on players to be fit for the whole season is, is huge. So it's not always going to be the case. And I think they have been unfortunate with a, with a few injuries. So to sort of have that option of, of players on the bench that can come on and, and, and play in different positions, it's obviously great for Carl to have, have that flexibility. And obviously for the squad, it, it improves everybody. OK, um, right. Before we uh, go to our first uh, interview today, which is with Rob Atkinson, who was the best player you played uh, in the same team as for Oxford United? A couple. Yeah. Robbie, I think when, when he first came, when when uh, he was only a kid straight out of West Ham. And obviously I, I haven't sort of been in that sort of position in my sort of younger years to, to step into that sort of team and that environment and, and do what he did at, at the age he was was unbelievable we, we'd never seen sort of anything like it really and he was brave strong scored a shed load of goals in, in that amount of time so and obviously ever since he's, he's done fantastically well to bounce back from from injuries he's had and and still give the, the performances he has with with the injuries he's had so um and also Lev's another one that that really I probably think we didn't quite see the best of Lev's I think a lot of people saw him on a Saturday and saw him do what he did but didn't realize behind the scenes he he, he had major sort of knee problems and Sort of stopped him probably performing to levels that he would have liked to, but on his day, still with, with with all the injuries, he could still be the best player on, on the park. So. Well, I do um, I do panto each year in Stoke. Obviously, <laughs> last year it didn't happen. But um, speaking to Port Vale fans, <laughs> the second I say I'm an Oxford fan, they we all remember the <laughs> same goal. <laughs> um, yeah, phenomenal player, and uh, obviously does what he wants. Yeah. Um, right, okay. Here is an interview with Rob Atkinson. We won 3 0, but in the injury time, you were throwing yourself, hurting yourself to keep a clean sheet. Well done, Rob. Did you enjoy yourself on Tuesday? Fuck. Oh, <laughs> um, I just wanted the, the game felt like it was going on forever. It's, <laughs> I was absolutely blowing I was towards the end, but I was desperate for um, for that clean sheet and to, to put the right, to put the, the game on Saturday. Obviously, we lost. I wanted to put the fact that we lost that right with a perfect performance really so three yeah. clean sheet if we'd conceded the goal and won 3-1 would you have slept oh. that night? <laughs> I don't sleep anyway after the <laughs> game I'm just <laughs> full of adrenaline yeah. and like lactic acid so it, it, but it's it's just like the Swindon game really conceding really late like it I mean it's great to beat Swindon but it leaves a little bit of a sour taste in your mouth such a bizarre goal as well so it's yeah, as a defender, like you just want when when the the attacking side goes so well, you want to complement it with 
yeah. with a defensive good performance as well. Which leaves us in a fantastic position, doesn't it? Two points off the playoffs. Very strong position with, what, 13, 12 games to go? I can't remember. Um, yeah, we've, we've been in this, I don't know how many times, but we've been in this sort of position where we're almost in the playoffs. So we kind of need to get over the line and uh, you know, actually physically see ourselves in in the top six, which would probably give us a, a good mental boost as well. It's unbelievable. I can now see the finishing line, can't you? You can see a dozen games to go. You can see the end of the season coming. It's unbelievable. Yeah, the weeks have just flown by. I mean, the fact that we've done the exact same sort of schedule routine for I don't even know how many weeks in a row now, but it just honestly it flies by. It's already Thursday and we're already thinking about Blackpool. It's, it's crazy. The We'll probably never do anything like what I'd like to think as a football. We'll never have this sort of schedule again. It's honestly, I'm just thankful that, you know, we've still got a fit, strong squad having played so many games and hopefully that will continue right to the very end because we're going to need every single person in the squad. Uh, we better talk up Shorty and the sports science and maybe Dwayne and the people like that are keeping you lot on track. That's no mean mean feat, is it, to keep you lot physically able to do this? Yeah, I mean, other teams other teams are struggling, I'd like to think, compared to like I'd thought. I kind of saw that at Doncaster. Mm -hmm. I felt like we were fitter, stronger, just faster than they was. And... Uh, I suppose you've got to, you know, compliment the sports science team for that. And I think what they've done and how they've kind of uh, scheduled us in and how, how they kind of, um, what's the word, like, get us doing every day is, you know, it's perfect for the times that we're in and how intense it is. So that's a credit to them. So Rob Atkinson there, um, obviously come from East Lee. Uh, he joined just as you left, that's right, isn't yeah. it? Um, but you sort of kept in contact with the club, so you, you sort of know about him and, yeah. and his ethos and sort of how far he can go as a player. Um, what is it? What are the biggest differences between playing league football and non-league football? It's very difficult. I think as, as a player who sort of played both, I think there's not a great deal in terms of Ability, you see a lot of good good players in non-league that don't maybe never get the chance to play football league and, and sort of professional football. So, I think sometimes a lot of it comes down to a bit of luck. You need to be sort of spotted the right time, picked up at the right time. And a lot of players sometimes that, that they're being looked at by bigger clubs and then they get an injury or which turns out that stops them getting getting that move. So, I think you've got to be lucky. You've got to have that that sort of element of luck, but also that once you're in that that sort of environment, you're in professional football. It's incredibly hard to stay there unless you're sort of dedicated enough to give up pretty much everything else to make sure you're you're at the level you need to be to, to stay at league, league level so um as well for a lot of players sometimes that, that that sort of side of it and that mentality to be able to do that is is not always there and, and that's why you sometimes see them sort of slip out of it yeah um it in terms of it, sort of the non-league and league differences mm -hmm. you obviously joined oxford when when they were non-league um helped them get promoted are you surprised how far they've gone where they're now sort of competing and, and season on season uh, looking up to the championship? No, I think, again, when, when I was here, that was always the aim. Like, I think with Kelvin and, and Chris and, and everybody associated with the club, it was always to, to get the club back to where we felt they belonged and, and where they, they'd previously been was always the aim to try and get them back to where the fans would love to see them, which is at the, the top level and, and challenging for, for major competitions. But I think for, for us, us as a player at that time, getting into the Football League, that was a start. And then it was always a case that we were going to build on that. And, and obviously the aim the first season back was to, to get promoted to League One. So um, I'm not surprised, but I, but I am sort of surprised at, at how well they are doing. And, and like I say, how sort of together this squad is. And obviously on the back of last season to miss out in the way they did sort of, sort of the heartbreak of that to then come back and, and put in this run they're doing at the minute. And, especially in terms of the, the amount of games they've played and, and the sort of small amount of recovery between games that they're doing fantastically well. And I think for, for obviously players that have, have played and then you, a lot of fans probably don't realise exactly what they're going through, not not having the fans here. It's for me being back and seeing games without fans is, is 
not the same as, as as football should be. So for them to be able to go out week in week out and, and perform the way they are without that is is sort of testament to them, really. Yeah, um, the the week in week out is obviously very different. Um, sports science, the training ground, all of that has changed so much mm-hmm. since you were here in in a very small amount of time. Yeah. Um, are you? Uh, are you sort of surprised how much has changed in that regard from uh, you were saying just before we went live? Mm. It was you'll get a phone call in the morning. It will tell you where you need to go for training. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, for the players, it makes such a difference to know, say, you, you, you've got your own training ground. You can come in. You've got your own facilities, your boots. Obviously, when, when I first joined, we were training at Milton then and you had to bring your own kit. And I remember tra- sort of traveling every day with Lewis Haldane and, and we would sort of grab a, a porridge from McDonald's and a coffee on the way here. And it's looking back it, it wasn't something we probably should have been doing but obviously when we got to a training ground there was no breakfast there was no food so it, it, obviously now that it's, it's all there for them they've, they've got everything they need to to perform to the highest level so um i wish i'd been <laughs> here later on in my career so i I'd have that sort of the facilities they've got now it's, it's a fantastic setup and it gives them really that platform to to hopefully kick on and, and like say get the best but guess that the best out of their ability and, and hopefully get them to where they want to be which is the, the highest level uh, when you when you joined uh, from Shrewsbury, I believe um, you at some point you became a club legend. Did you decide early on, or at what point did you go? I'm going to stay here. I think when I was on loan, I came in initially on a year's loan. But I remember speaking with Chris. I probably Chris came in. I think just before Christmas and of that season, and uh, quite quickly he was like, "Look, I want want you to be." the sort of top man here. I want to sort of build a squad around you and I, I want to be successful and, and me and you sort of together can can make that happen. So for me, it was something I'd not had in my career. I'd, I'd not had that sort of relationship with a manager that had been sort of seen me as a, as a number one player. I'd obviously been at Warsaw and sort of didn't really get the, the opportunity there. So I left and then obviously Kidderminster, I came in and did had a great time there, but then obviously took the step up to Shrewsbury again and, and obviously we with that, I, n- I never had that that feeling either. So to come in and have that Oxford straight away, it was it, it sort of put me at ease and it gave me that freedom to go out and perform and know that, that I had the full backing of the manager. And I think for, for players up and down the sort of country, that's not always the case. And that isn't sort of either you're going to get the best out, out of your players is not having that that sort of relationship which gives them that belief that that you're fully behind them. Uh, and sort of foresight <laughs> like that with, with Chris Wilder speaking to you and saying this is what I want to do and it actually paying off probably shows why he has reached the premiership and, and exactly. how his career has gone. Yeah, and then and I think if you speak to a lot of players that played in that year and, and following years and, and obviously his time at Northampton and, and what he's gone on to Sheffield United, I think we played him when I was at Eastleigh, we played Sheffield United and, and a lot of them sort of said he's exactly the same now as he was here and at Berry and all the other clubs he was at because he's got the same attitude and, and the same hunger to be successful and I think for the players, we, we, we got on with him, we could have a laugh with him like on the way home after a game, he'd always he'd be the first one. Look, let's stop, get some beers, and, and, and win or lose. He had this, that same attitude. But come a Monday morning, nine o'clock, he was working, and it was work till till Saturday. And then Saturday and Sunday, that was our sort of time, our downtime. But you knew, sort of, come Monday, that was we were ready to go again. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, on to now. Uh, you're a fan bringer. Yeah. Um, the season's just finished. Uh, I mean, what does that do morale wise for you? It's been tough. Um, we came back um, quite early. We came back sort of end of May, June time, just because it was our first sort of appointment, me and Wingy, and we, we didn't know the players too well. So we thought we'd give ourselves plenty of time to get to know them. And obviously training wise, we could only train in, in small groups, four or five at a time. So we knew we couldn't get everyone together. So we, we sort of staggered it out like that. And then we sort of managed to start playing and the game started coming and obviously the fans were in at, at our level, but obviously not here, which for us, we couldn't really sort of get our head around why we were allowed six, seven hundred fans at, at home games, but obviously, club like Oxford weren't allowed. So, um, and it stayed like that until sort of November. We had a fantastic FA Cup run and did really well. Got knocked out in, in the first round in the end, but um, after that, it was it was a case. I remember the build up to the game. They were like, obviously, if you get through, you'd, you've got to stop playing league games. So, and then you'd be back in for the next round of the FA Cup. So we were like, obviously, if we won, we might have a break of two, three weeks where we weren't allowed to train, weren't allowed to play, but then you could you could play in the next round. So it didn't really come at a great time because I think it unsettled a lot of the players to know that, obviously, if they did win the game, then we've got to 
go home and not see each other for another two, three weeks before the next game. So it was it was a tough time for, for us really in, in sort of sense of how well we had been doing in the competition to get that news sort of weeks before. And then obviously the first round we'd had fans for, for every other round, but the first round we weren't allowed fans either. So I think that didn't have players. We, we'd gone from the sort of normality of having people there to not having people there supporting us. So that made it difficult. But like I say, it's 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 been a fr- frustrating sort of season. It's just unfortunate because of the, the sort of environment that, that we, we we had to stop, but we fully understood why and, and the reasoning behind it. But obviously it, it makes it no easier than sort of spending Saturday, Saturday and watching Soccer Saturday or, or watching Oxford, just wishing that we could be out there doing the same. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and I, you don't get any sort of secret heads up. This is what's going to change next or you will be able to do this. You find out when you're watching the, the broadcast <laughs> yeah. like everyone else. You flick, flick through Twitter and you find out, oh, the season's been cancelled. Like we... We found that that obviously again it's, it's 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 very hard to sort of point fingers because no one's been through this this sort of pandemic and and obviously the the leagues and all the the sort of governing bodies have never been through this situation so i think they found it very difficult for them to to be able to sort of relay messages and, and probably plan a little bit sort of future proof the the season but like i say we, we found out with, with everyone else just over sort of the, the social medias that our season had been cancelled but i think we were we were pretty sensible we knew sort of after December, January time, we had already started looking towards sort of next season and planning for that. So um, that's what we've been doing really is looking forward for, for next season and, and getting back out there. Uh, I think I, I can speak for a lot of Oxford United fans when I say that when everything is back, um, if as long as there's not a fixed a fixture mm-hmm. clash, you'll get a lot of Oxford fans at games. So hopefully... Yeah, then they have been. They have been. We, we, we did last season. We had, uh, obviously, because they weren't always allowed in here and to, to watch Oxford, they they did come up and watch us on on many occasions, and it was always nice to be to be back in Oxfordshire and, and obviously bump into fans at games and, and and get that feeling that I did when I was here, and they were obviously fantastic the whole time I was here. So it's been great to have have a few of them follow us as well this season while well, it lasted. Uh, right, okay, on to today. Um, we're about to play uh, Blackpool. Did you ever play against Blackpool? I think so. Yeah. Did you score? Hopefully. <laughs> Let's say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't checked that. Yeah, um, here is a, a, a Blackpool Rewind. Uh, there we go. Uh, so that was um, us beating Blackpool a few years ago. Um, right, Bino, are you FC picks? Have you done your picks for the day? I did. I did the. Um, I did some for the Swindon game. Like I say, not not many people sort of realised, but I, we that was the second recording. We we did the first one, and I, I think it had been a long day at work. But I'd done all the picks on the um, the Charlton game on the Saturday because they called me on the Thursday, sort of forgetting that they had, we had the the big. Sort of derby on the Tuesday night, which is obviously why they were calling me. But I completely just just got, had a nice chat about Charlton. Yeah, I just talked about Charlton and and then had to sort of do that groveling text. Sorry, mate. Like I think I made a mistake. You need to you need to record again. So um, unfortunately, wasted a, a lot of 
their sort of time that night because they spent a lot longer than with me than they probably expected. But no, it's good fun. I really enjoyed it. It's uh, it's good to be able to, to do anything that, that obviously gives people some sort of involvement at home. They can join in and and try and uh, and try and beat us and, and obviously get some in, involved in the game and which they would obviously love to be here doing and, and sort of seeing it in person. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, that's a good thing that can happen. Uh, today's match sponsors are Grant and Stone. Um, as a player, um, when you get selected as man of the match, how grateful are you to that match sponsor or your shirt sponsor? Is there a, it, does it help build the relationship between that company and you personally and the club? I think at the time you, you don't really sort of think of it too much. It's just like say you, you're secretly happy you've been given man of the match unless you've lost and then you, you don't really want to be man of the match, although it's still not nice to, to get that award. But I think especially when you've won, it's, all, it's always nice to get that recognition. But then obviously to, a, a lot of the times you we, we'd go upstairs or downstairs and we'd meet everybody and we'd have sort of handshakes and like you can get awards. You can and, your champagne. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But obviously now you've just got to stand at sort of and, and have a picture on your own and, and interview on your own. And it's not quite the same. But like I say, it was always nice to, to meet the people behind the, the, the sort of the sense of, of them obviously sponsoring the, the game, putting money into the club, helping the club. And and obviously, since being at Banbury, you realise how, how important that is, especially at that level. It's it's the reason that, that, that sort of the, the, the clubs at that level can continue to, to work is, is having that sort of sponsorship and that money coming in. So obviously at the time, you don't, you don't sort of think about it too much. But then as you get older, I think you, you, you realise how important it is and, and what a difference it makes to a football club. Is that the same for shirt sponsors who, who have sponsored you specifically throughout the season, home or away, yeah. or whatever? Um, you obviously get to see their faces quite yeah. often when they, they and and probably tell you, I sponsor your shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, is that a good relationship to have? Yeah, it's nice. I think, say, the, the seasons I was here, you'd have the same people that would sponsor you, and then we'd obviously have a, a big do at the end of the season, and normally sort of a meal and awards, and then you'd get to sort of see the person that sponsored your kit. And it was great to have that sort of relationship because then you could. You, you, they knew they were getting your shirt handed over and you could sort of thank them for their support and it was just good for the club but like I say at the minute again it's, it's not something that we've been able to do so um, I think it's going to be sort of different this year but yeah it makes a, a huge difference to know sort of who your sponsors are and, and, and effectively why they want to sponsor you they, they obviously like you as a, as a person and they, and they want to have your shirt and stuff at the end of it so it's obviously nice to, to sort of meet them and, and thank them for their support throughout the year. I think there are over a hundred reasons to yeah. uh, to sponsor you as a as a shirt. Um, right, normally at this point I'd be speaking to uh, Martin Fedetsky about um, sort of how we've been against uh, Blackpool in the past. There's a graphic there that will help you out, so you can say this <laughs> as if you knew it anyway. Yeah, um, they've obviously uh, had the the slight edge, yeah. but it is very slight, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, when you're prepping for a game, does that sort of stat come into your head at all? Do you get told it? Uh, it depends. It, it, it is something that, like I say, under Chris, we 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 did probably a lot of that more than uh, than I'd been used to before. But I think really you'd probably only go back into, like say, the last meeting of, of the same season or possibly one in the previous season if it was of a, of a game of a certain distance down the road. It might be something you might sort of bring up. But I think... For them, it'd probably be to look back at their previous meeting this season, and, and that would be as sort of far as it went. It, like say, season on season, teams change and and players change, so it's very difficult to to always compare the sort of two. Yeah, um, and and then uh, this is sort of more recent form, um, very similar in terms of how many were scored, how many assists, and um, of of the leading assister. Yeah. Um, one point difference between the two clubs it's going to be a tight game isn't it it is and like I say that that will probably be more of the the pre-match talk will, will be about league position and points and games in hand as rather than like previous meetings and, and things so obviously for them having a, a couple of games in hand and knowing if they win they've got that sort of cushion of, of games in hand but obviously if we win we've got the cushion of knowing that, that they've got the games in hand but they've got to win them to to, to keep on the same points as us so there is that that sort of mentality and that sort of that, that will be probably lead most of the, the pre-match rather than than the sort of previous meetings it's going to be look put a marker down and, and get yourself in a position where you're ahead of that team and it's it's hard for them to catch you because that's ideally what you want to be doing at this time of year is, is putting your gap between yourself and the team chasing yep absolutely uh right normally at this point i would ask uh martin bradetsky i basically pick two players that have both uh, played for both sides mm -hmm. 
um, and ask, according to Wikipedia, who played more times for Blackpool, John Lundstrom or Luke Garbutt? Um, I would go for Luke Garbutt. Luke Garbutt. Um, I haven't seen if he's playing today. If he is, it'll be the 19th game. So he's played 18, that's <laughs> far, according to Wikipedia. And John Lundstrom, 17. So you got that right. Oh, that's, a one closer, one. that's a lot closer than <laughs> what I thought it would be. Uh, right, okay. Um, other things uh, I would normally talk to him about at the programme. Did you ever keep any match programmes from when you played? You would not believe how many programmes I've got in my house. Obviously just moved, like I remember sort of after every game I would I'd always get in trouble because I'd come home and I'd for whatever reason I'd bring like five of the same programme because it was like I thought four got damaged, I'd serve number one and if I lost one I'd serve number one. So I've gone through boxes and I must have over a thousand programmes easy. And like from every game or this the seasons that I've got one from from every game that, that I played. There's ones from obviously all the different clubs I've played at. So I've got a huge amount of, of memories and programmes because it was I say something I used to get told off quite a bit for because but I, I just loved having a copy that I could take home and sort of look at afterwards because it wasn't always something a lot of players sort of pick it up and read front to back and read every little note for me I was sort of too interested in getting myself ready for the game that I didn't didn't always have time to read it so it, it'd be nice to sort of either read it on the bus on the way home if we we won or sort of later down the line if, if we hadn't picked up a result I could sort of read it later on in the week so it was always nice to do but now trying to go through it and try to sort of put it into some sort of order is is, is crazy. Yeah, um, as as someone who acts, it's reached the point my wife has stopped keeping ticket stubs. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, you've got, probably she kept ticket stubs or kept programmes yeah. for a bit as well. Yeah. And you, you've both collected the same stuff. Yeah, well, I've gone through and I, I only literally a couple of days ago, I found obviously that I, a collection of three or four of the Wembley programmes from, from that game and I opened it and there, in there was all the notes that Chris had, done so like all the like the booklet of, of notes we had for that game five six seven pages worth of, of stuff which no one would have probably saved back then like I, I imagine players after Wembley there would have been champagne and it would have all been ruined but obviously I had it and we've got all the set plays how we set up and obviously notes from mum and dad that they sort of sneaked into my my sort of kit bag for the day but it's just nice to to keep those things because like I say I've kept so much memorabilia through the years of, of, of like say being here and at other clubs it was it's nice to now sort of have a house that I can get it out and, and sort of look back and, and sort of remember all the great times I had throughout my career. Do you ever watch the game back and go, oh, I didn't do what I was meant to on that piece? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I remember sort of, the, especially Wembley, the shot I had that sort of spoon wide and, and it was at an important time at, at 2-1 that, that could sort of put the game to bed. But obviously we had Alfie there to to sort of spare my blushes a little bit. But it just made it more yeah, exciting exactly, at the end. It exactly. was fine. It was fine. But yeah, the, the kid in it's the one, especially I've, I've never watched back the, uh, the, the the final we played in 2007 and never been able to sort of watch that back. So, But, but that yeah. was probably good for Oxford because it made you more determined to put it right. A hundred percent. And it's, it's what I've probably said. That was probably the lowest point in my career. And then obviously three years later and, and walking back up the stairs at, at sort of the, the greatest stadium I've played in as, as, uh, to, to pick it up as a, as a winner made it even sweeter that I'd been there sort of three years earlier in tears and, and not wanting to, to sort of leave and, and be swallowed up. So it was great to go back and, and sort of put those demons to bed. Really. Uh, right, before we finish things off, uh, what was your favourite goal you scored? Favourite goal? Um, there's there's a few, like obviously in terms of importance, uh, my 100th at uh, Mansfield was a was a, a huge highlight. And, and for me, when I first joined here, I, I couldn't have imagined that I'd go on and score 100 goals. It was... Uh, it seemed like a huge sort of feat to do that. So to do that was was a was a massive honour. But obviously Wembley, what it meant sort of long term, and, and obviously every time I come back here, it's it's a strange feeling to be back here knowing that the, the, this was a place I scored a lot of goals and and uh, had a, had a great sort of six years. So it's always nice to come back. But like you say, Wembley was was definitely one of the the big highlights for me and, and one of my sort of most important goals probably in my career. Uh, what, when you are sort of on 99, is that in your head the whole time? Yeah. I think even on 96, 97, like, it was always 100. I want to get to 100 and I want to give myself the, the best opportunity. Obviously, I was aware of the record from from when I was on sort of 50 goals of, of who was the top scorer. And I always believed that I could get to that. And then the game sort of starts going quicker and quicker. And uh, obviously that season, I knew I, I, knew I was sort of, sort of badgering every interview I was ever done to, to get a new deal. I was like, oh, I'd love to stay. And, well, and, and Chester. Yeah, I mean, that, exactly. that must get brought up. At the time, time. yeah. It, it wasn't something I saw as too much of a, a biggie. Obviously, I was gutted the goals had been taken away, but 
obviously I had no clues to what that meant sort of long term but yeah I remember just just desperate to to try and get another deal and, and stay and and obviously break the record but it just wasn't meant to be and and obviously Chester, Chester went and, and ruined it for me. <laughs> Still a club legend. Um, thank you very much for, for joining me today. Pleasure. And hopefully we can get you back at some point. Um, for everyone who's watching, thanks very much for watching. Make sure you get your iFollow pass. Right now, Chris Williams is going to start the match report. Martin Fredetsky will be on Twitter and Liam Potter will be around the ground filming the moments that you missed. I'm going to be on Instagram, so keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, go and get your iFollow pass. And thanks for listening. Following your heart in spirit, in soul. You make every tackle, score every goal. You're part of it, wherever you are in the world. From the first minute until the last kick. Victories, heartbreaks. You're part of the fabric, the passion, devotion, supercharging emotion. For you, there is only one, abiding loyalty togetherness that is second to none follow every kick every tackle every goal with access to live stream games and match day commentary with coverage spanning the globe behind the scene content newsletters and match highlights there's no better way for you to get closer to your club and with like follow sales supporting them there's no better way to show your love and you can't be there be there with iPhone.